If that's all your book takes to devolve, you wrote a bad book. It's a murder mystery, but it's not, but it is. So I'm just not interested. This is my combined 2023 in review, worst books, best books, and December wrap up because I'm too lazy to film multiple videos. I don't have enough content for multiple videos and I'm tired. So let's just get into it. Let's start with the Goodreads year in review stats. My year in books, I read 17,028 pages and 48 books. Okay, so we're gonna start here. I did not meet my reading goal because last year, was it last year or was it two years ago? I don't know, when I started kind of reading again in mass, uh, I got to like 76 books last year and I thought, oh, I can, I can totally do 100 books. And so I set my goal this year is 100 books. No. No, I, I could not do that. I got 48, it was so bad. To be fair, I did have surgery, quit my job, starting a brand new career. I did not have as much free time as I expected and all the free time that I had like for my surgery. I was exhausted, I was sleeping a lot. The only thing I could do was just like watch TV and process. Like I couldn't mentally compute more than that. So uh, yeah, didn't do great. Um, but that's okay because I will say I think for the most part I enjoyed the books that I read. I think I had pretty good discerning taste in those books. My shortest book was only 128 pages long and it was The Genius and the Goddess by Aldous Huxley. My longest book was 882 pages long which was Charles Dickens's David Copperfield. Average book length 354 pages. Um, the most shelved which I'm guessing is the most popular book that I read this year compared to other people was The Catcher on the Rye by J.D. Salinger and the least shelved which doesn't surprise me is Every Shade of Happy by Philita Shrimpton. Um, yeah so my average rating for 2023 is 4.1 stars. I think that's pretty phenomenal out of 48 books to have an average of 4.1 stars. I'm not gonna go through all of these because my goodness, um, but I'm gonna just try to pick out a few that I really appreciated. We'll start in January. My very first book of the year was The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that even close to correct. Um, he is the author of my all-time favorite book, The Count of Monte Cristo, which I am currently reading. Thanks to Emma and Carolyn for their Game of Tomes book club choice of January, February, 2024. Absolute adore the book, The Count of Monte Cristo. So I wanna read more by Dumas. So um, turns out he is the author of The Three Musketeers, which also turns out is a series. I did not realize that. So I have The Three Musketeers, read it. I also have the sequel to that, which is The Red Sphinx, which I have not read. Three Musketeers, I did give five stars. It is not as good as The Count of Monte Cristo, and I am a little worried <laughs> that I started with Dumas at his all-time best work. I mean, to be fair, I don't know how you would top The Count of Monte Cristo. I think that would be very difficult, so it might even be impossible, but I did enjoy The Three Musketeers. It was fun, it was adventurous, it just it wasn't as captivating a story. And I think partly because you did follow multiple characters more so than you do in The Count of Monte Cristo. And with The Count, you get his kind of whole life story, even though the, the metamorphosis of him from um, Edmond Dante into The Count is kind of glossed over. You still get his origin story and then his um, revenge arc. So I think you're more invested in him as a character, whereas The Three Musketeers, while it does mostly follow one of the fourth musketeer who isn't really part of The Three Musketeers, Porthos, Athos, and I can never remember the last one's name, but I think it also starts with a P. Um, you just weren't as gripped by their story because it's, it's following four of them. You don't really get any of their backstory, but there's a lot of political intrigue and action adventure comedy. I do like it. I read Toni Morrison, um, A Mercy, and also God Help the Child. Read both of those this year. 
very, very good on both of them. I think both are at least a four star, if not a five. I think I liked God Help the Child more, but I think it was because it was set in the 1980s, so it was more relatable for me versus A Mercy, which is set, I want to say, late 1800s. Both are phenomenal stories, though. Toni Morrison is an incredible author. I read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. First time I have read this cult classic, and I did really enjoy it. I think I gave that one five stars as well. Very funny. I do now want to see the movie with, I almost said Morgan Freeman, Martin Freeman. Um, yeah, I do want to see the movie with Martin Freeman just because I adore Martin Freeman as well. Um, and I'm curious if it's a close adaptation to the book, which I did quite enjoy. This on my list was one of the few current books. I want to say this was a new release for 2024. I don't typically read a lot of new releases, but I did pick up Age of Vice by Deepthi Kapoor. I think I gave this a four star. Now, here's the thing. When this book says Age of Vice, it's not kidding. There, it's, hmm, there's a lot of serious, heavy topics. A lot of the characters are not good people. Um, bad things happen. Uh, they do bad things. They have a lot of vices. And because of like the nature of the book, because of the style of writing, it is a very dark, detailed, impactful book. I think it was incredibly well written. I just kind of struggled with the heaviness of the material and that is on me as a reader, that is not on the author. So if that's your kind of thing, I would say, you know, go for it. Um, okay, Peach Blossom Spring. I don't think this is a super new release. I don't think this is 2024 or anything, but it's newer and I, you know, you know me, I tend to read classics. I love this book. This is the story of specifically one woman and her son. And the first part of the book is she loses her husband in like the first chapter. She has to raise her son basically on her own. She does have her husband's family that she's with in China, um, but war is approaching from the Japanese and they're having to flee their home. And so it really ends up being her and her son kind of against the world. Um, do they separate from his, from her husband's family? Do they stick with them? You know, what does that mean for the, their possible future paths? And then the second half of the book, maybe like the, the last third of the book, is her son as an adult, he makes it to America, and then he begins his own family, and he is having to like kind of unpack and deal with his childhood trauma and what that means for the way he raises his daughter. And this book was, beautiful and heartbreaking and infuriating and frustrating and it was phenomenal and I wanted to give it five stars but when it follows Henry which becomes his American name it kind of slows down I feel like and drags a little bit and he is frustrating as a character but he's written in a, such a realistic way like these are real frustrations that I feel like it just, he just he's such a real person and the way that he reacts the way that he thinks and and the way that he approaches the world not just with raising his daughter but how he exists in the world um, as a scientist as a Chinese immigrant at a very tumultuous time in American history it's so well portrayed but just because it slows down and lags a little bit is kind of where I ended up with four, four and a half star, not quite a five star, but I absolutely loved it. This is by Melissa Fu. So I would highly recommend if, if any of that sounds interesting to you, check out Peach Blossom Spring. We're going to talk about the Three Body Problem series. I don't remember, hold on, let me pull this up. What was it called? Remembrance of Earth's Past. So this encompasses the Three Body Problem, the Dark Forest, and Death's End. These are um, science fiction by um, Chinese author Xi Xin Lu. And the series as a whole, five stars. Uh, I think I gave The Three Body Problem four stars. The Dark Forest, I think I gave four stars. And then Death's End, I gave five stars. 
I have not talked about them that much on this channel because I genuinely, I genuinely don't know how. The story encompassed in this book is, is more expansive, I think, than I have ever experienced outside of possibly Doctor Who. This book does not focus on a single character in a single time period. This book spans thousands of years, millennia. Spoilers. So it starts in the three body problem with Earth basically becoming aware of the fact that they, humans are not alone in the universe. Um, and specifically, there is one intelligent society that is out there called the Solarans. Solarans. Solarans? They're from the planet Solaris. Their planet is basically on a path to destruction. They are a representation of the mathematical um, idea of the three body problem about three bodies in a random motion pattern. And if all three bodies are in a random orbit, can, can, they, can their, their trajectory eventually be predicted? And so far the problem has never been solved. Um, and their planet being in this means that it has stable periods and unstable periods. And when it's unstable, nothing can survive on the surface of the planet. They basically find a way to preserve themselves and there's one or there's a few tiny facilities across the planet that basically watch for signs of a stable time period where they bring everybody else out of stasis and try to continue their society. So they find out about Earth, Earth finds out about them, and they start coming to take over the planet. Um, they do not have the capacity to lie or deceive, or so they say. Um, humanity, obviously, very good at that. So. That's really where the three body problem ends is they make contact with humanity and are like, hey, we're gonna book it for Earth. The dark forest. Okay, so there's the principle of, let's say you're in a pitch black forest, you can't see anything else and nothing else can see you. What is your best way to survive? And that is to know that there are predators out there and to not let them know where you are. So in this dark force of the universe, Earth is sending out all of these signals and like thinking out there, you know, there's all these advanced societies and they're going to be peaceful and utopian and they're going to want to share technology with us and, you know, have this, this beautiful um, relationship with humans to bring us into the next golden age. And it turns out, oh, there's, there's societies out there. Yeah. Don't, don't do it because you're basically just asking to be picked off by a stronger predator. So it talks about the way that humanity breaks into factions as with anything else. And some people think it's worth it to try to reach out. Others think it's better to cut off all communication. And then there, that dark forest theory comes into play. And then they kind of get the indication that dark forest theory is correct. Oh. I, I can't see this is why I didn't talk about it because I can't explain it well. So, you, I mean, you're talking thousands of years in the future. There have been ages of humanity that have gone high technology and then they've reverted back to, you know, very primitive because they're realizing the dangers of technology and all these other things. So at the end of Dark Forest, it's realizing we are not alone and we are not prepared to defend ourselves. And humanity realizes that the Solaran fleet that's coming towards them is the least of their worries. Okay, so now you go to Death's End. Like, I'm probably spoiling the entire series. I should probably, I'm gonna cut this in before this. Spoilers, Solaran fleet is on the way. We can't even defend against them. Uh, basically what we do is decide we're just gonna go mad. Mutually assured destruction. If the Solarans come and mess with Earth, we are going to send a signal out into the universe to call all the other predator civilizations to come and destroy them and us because, hey, at least then we're all gone, right? Again, there's different factions of humanity fighting for different things. So this book explores the idea of what are the best chances of humanity's survival? Send some out into spaceships. So many thousands of years have gone by, we have space travel. Um, and a lot of the technology, technological advances made were because Solarans shared with humanity 
um, up to a certain point, uh, you know, physics and engineering and all these other things so that human society could advance technologically to the point of space travel. So a faction goes off in spaceships to basically never return, you know, find some other place to live to continue on humanity should Earth be compromised. Another faction starts moving humanity out further into our own solar system. There's Mars, there's Jupiter, there's Saturn. And whether it be an orbital space station or whether it try, you know, be trying to uh, have colonies and communities on the planet surfaces or on the surface of the moons of these planets, continuing society that way. So that if something should happen to Earth, maybe these other ones can kind of escape notice. And then there's the, I don't remember what it's called in the book, but basically people are like, there's no escape, just live for today kind of a thing. You know, maybe things will all work out and it'll probably not happen in that probably won't happen in my lifetime, so I'm not gonna worry about it. Again, deeper spoilers. The, the reason that I say that this is so expansive, even up to and possibly even beyond Doctor Who, is because it talks about literally the end of time, the end of the universe, the end of matter. I mean, it talks about fourth dimensional, four dimensional space encroaching on three-dimensional space and two-dimensional space encroaching on three-dimensional space and what will happen in the end when the universe is just it's out of time it's out of energy it cannot be sustained and the universe ends what does it matter how long humanity survives this attack or that attack because eventually everything will be gone in the universe that we know and then the theory comes out that in that instance when this universe dissipates, a new universe will be born because there's never any true destruction of matter or energy. It simply restarts, it simply converts. Is it possible for humanity to make it into the next universe? And the way that the book ends, I'm not going to spoil the actual ending, but the way that the book ends was so perfect and so beautiful and it was hopeful, but also almost hopeless. It, uh, I, this book, this whole series, I mean, it really makes you think. It is a sci-fi series. It does have hard sci-fi, hard science, and I'm not the person to say whether any of this is accurate or not, but it all sounds plausible to the listener if you're you know, following along, paying attention. You know, don't be intimidated by it because a lot of the characters in the book don't understand the the scientific concepts and it's other characters having to explain it but it's all done very naturally it never really feels like an info dump it's like it builds on itself in a natural way throughout the books throughout the series um, across the different characters and I, it, it explores themes of morality and time and space and distance and i'm not going to say the meaning of life or the purpose of life but the human desire to continue the survival of the species, but to do so only if it's within a moral confine or context. What would be the point of the human species continuing on in, a, in survival if it goes to there without any morality with it that makes it human? It was so good. It was so good. It's so in-depth. I really wish I could have done a better job of explaining it. I can't. That's really the best I can do right now, but I would highly recommend it if you're at all interested in sci-fi. Part of it takes part in space, but most of it takes place on Earth dealing with these concepts of space travel and, you know, uh, interdimensionality, uh, pocket dimensions, just physics and mathematics and things that I am not normally interested in, but I am a huge sci-fi fan, and so somehow this series just really clicked with me. And the discussions of morality when combined with science, I thought were, are, they're never more timely than they are right now. And they're going to continue to get more and more timely as time goes on, as technology progresses. And I think this is an incredible series that I would highly recommend to anybody. Overall series, five stars. All right, so on a lighter note, let's talk about Every Shade of Happy, which was the book that I read this year that was like the least popular, the least well-known 
I really enjoyed this. This book made me think of my own grandfather. So the story uh, goes that there is a woman um, with a daughter. She never got married to the father. Um, and as a result, her parents sort of severed the relationship with her, more so her father. Um, her mother passes, uh, she, so her father's been living alone for a number of years. Her daughter is now a teenager and she's never met her grandfather. Something happens in the mother's life. Her longtime boyfriend basically says, I am a different person than I thought I was. I need to explore this and you need to move out. So she doesn't have anywhere else to go but home to her grand to her father and bring her daughter who's never met her grandfather just while she gets back on her feet and it talks about the relationship specifically of the granddaughter and the grandfather it was so well done it really a lot of the conflict and a lot of the momentum of the story centered along the, the lines of the trope of miscommunication normally i hate that that is my least favorite bookish trope hate it because be an adult and have a two second conversation problem solved you don't have a book anymore though if that's all your book takes to devolve you wrote a bad book this was well done i feel like this was a master class in that trope in that it can be done well and it shocked even me the reason it was done well is because you're in the characters heads both the granddaughter and the grandfather and when these miscommunications happen you see it happening from usually the perspective of the recipient, the one being given conflicting signals or you know, having, being on the receiving end of that communication that they're misunderstanding. And then you flip into the perspective of the person trying to communicate and you're seeing their struggle with it. And a, and a lot of the times it's the grandfather not knowing how to articulate how he's feeling. He doesn't even really understand how he's feeling, so he doesn't have words for it. And so you, you see this thought process of where he knows he's just screwed something up, but he doesn't understand exactly how, and he gets even more frustrated with himself, which further inhibits his ability to communicate well. And this is so realistic. I helped care for my grandfather when he was in the last year of his life. and. As he got older and as he had different health challenges, his ability to cope and stay calm diminished and his ability to communicate what he was feeling and what he was thinking and what he needed also diminished. And it frustrated him very much that he couldn't easily, clearly communicate what he needed in the moment. And it takes a lot of patience, it takes a lot of understanding to get past that and I knew what was going on and I'd had a relationship with him my whole life. I adored him. So it was a lot easier for me to know this isn't characteristic of him. He just needs to calm down. We need to reassure him that everything's okay. And once he's calmer, then he can more easily articulate what it is he wants to say. But because these two people had never had a relationship and they didn't understand each other, they didn't know each other that well, and they didn't understand themselves. You have this elderly man who's dealing with his own childhood trauma that he's seeing reflected in his granddaughter and he wants to help, but he doesn't know how because he's never unpacked his own trauma. And then you have this teenager who her entire life has been uprooted. She has no friends near her. She doesn't have any family other than her mother and the stranger who is her grandfather in a new school where her bubbly, colorful personality is very much being um, subdued from forces both from the school, their dress code, and the other students who are not used to her. She doesn't, so she doesn't really deal with like bullying per se, but she's just in this very subdued atmosphere and she stands out because she likes to play with makeup, like colorful makeup, like fairy, you know, drawing on her face and painting her nails all different colors and you know, dressing, she's not used to dressing in a drab school uniform. She's used to tons of color and where she came from, you know, that was more acceptable and she had a strong friend group and now she doesn't have any of that. The building of this relationship between these two characters was just beautiful. It was so well done. And the fact that the characters really worked at their communication to get over the miscommunication just that's how you do this 
that's how you do this. If you want to read a book that is based on the trope of miscommunication, but you want it done well, read this book. It's super charming. It is not that long of a read. It's just, it's very wholesome. And it just, it's very reflective of real life, real personal relationships, and real people dealing with things that they're just, they don't have the tools necessarily to deal with on their own, or they've never had to. They've never been forced to, and now they have. It's so good. I really loved this. I think I give this a five star. <sighs> okay, the next book I want to talk about is Confessions by Kanai Minato. I actually heard somebody talk about a book, the plot and the writing style and the, the writing devices sounded identical, but it was a completely different book, which really weirded me out. Um, but this is a, it's a murder mystery, but it's not, but it is. So there's a, I think she's like a middle school teacher and her daughter dies at her school. She brought her to school after work to get some stuff, you know, some stuff done. And then she loses track of her daughter. She finds her out by the pool, you know, drowned basically at the, at the school pool. Eventually she figures out the cause of her daughter's death. She knows who was involved. She knows who's covering it up. Instead of going to the police and, you know, reporting everything she knows, the death was ruled accidental. There was nobody around. Nobody can prove otherwise, but she knows. So the last day of school, she sits her classroom down and she said, I'm going to tell you a story. And she never names any names, but the way that she describes the events and the people involved, all of the students know exactly who she's talking about. And that kid is in her class. So she basically outs the killer and then lets the class deal with it. And she retires, disappears. Then you see from the killer's perspective, I said, I don't know if I'm getting it in the right order. I'm not getting into the writer. Anyway, you see, you end up seeing from like two or three more perspectives, the same sequence of events, but from different people who actually had more involvement than you realize. So the way that I first described this book is from the teacher's perspective, you get the story and you see this picture and you're like, that's it. I get it. I get everything. I know everything. I know who did it. And then you get the next perspective and you're like, oh, oh, the picture is even bigger than that. Now I get it. Now I see everything. And then the next perspective. And then finally you get the final perspective and you're like, it's not that the picture changed. It's that you saw what you were meant to see each step of the way. I thought it was very well done. I thought it was, it's, it's not a, a, a writing style that everybody's going to click with the fact that you're changing narrators and you know, things are kind of muddy because of it. And you think, you know what you know, but you don't but it was something I personally really enjoyed. I really liked the writing style. I really liked the mystery of it and the slow reveal of more details, more perspectives. It kind of reminds me of the movie Vantage Point. Uh, I think, was that Jim Caviezel and Dennis Quaid? I could be totally wrong. I haven't seen that movie in a long time, but I really liked that movie because it's the same event from multiple perspectives. And each time you think you know the full story and then you see the new perspective and you're like, oh my God, that's such a different, the same, but a different story than I thought. So yeah. Also, I recommend that movie. It's pretty good. All right. I'm not going to talk about too many more. I'm just going to list them off kind of quickly because I have no idea how long this video is getting. Please don't this is even still recording. Um, I read Daisy Jones and the Six. I thought this book was phenomenal. Um, I, I had read the first Taylor Jenkins read that I read was Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo. I didn't really love it. Um, the writing was fine. It was it was pretty good in parts. Hated the character that was like the, I'm not gonna say the narrator, but the, the girl who is recording the life story of Evelyn Hugo. Did not like how she was written. She was not believable um, in any way, shape or form. And I find it interesting that the biracial character in that novel written by a white woman is the least real feeling. I feel like that's, you know, kind of an indictment of the book itself. Um, I did not care for the plot twist at the end. I don't, there was no need for a plot twist. That story didn't need a plot twist at all. It, it, I don't feel it was done respectfully. Um, I feel like it was using a character 
of a marginalized community in a way that had the book not had that in it, I think it would have been better. Was the, the, was the twist like exciting or, you know, shocking? Yes. But her throwaway use of marginalized communities doesn't sit well with me. Um, and I just, I, I don't like it. It made me uncomfortable. And I, other, other reviewers have criticized the same thing and I, I totally agree with them. Um, I think she could have just totally had a great book without that, you know, or even swapped the character out for a non-marginalized person and, you know, made a couple other tweaks and then you would have had the same shocking impact without abusing these characters. Um, but so I thought I was never going to read another Taylor Jenkins read book and I finally broke down and read Daisy Jones and the Six. I had the complete opposite reaction to this. I thought this was phenomenally written. I thought all of the characters felt quite real. The struggles that they went through, I appreciated the portrayal of drugs and alcohol and the negative impacts that these have on people when they are abused in this way. The interpersonal relationships I thought were super well done. Um, the time, the setting, everything worked in this book. It was a five star read for me. I really loved it and I appreciated the, dep the depiction of these characters who struggle with drug and alcohol abuse and, um, and addiction and that it didn't demonize the people. And I, I, I really appreciate that because as somebody who knows and loves people who struggle with substance abuse disorders, it does them no good. It does them so much harm to be demonized as a person, as though these are personality flaws, these are character flaws, because they struggle with these things. And I actually really liked the way this book handled them. Um, it just treated people as people who had struggles and had to realize for themselves whether or not they wanted to be rid of them and the struggle of being rid of them if that's what they chose to do. Loved it. I still don't think I'm going to be reading any more Taylor Jenkins read, especially not, um, is it Malibu Rising and Carrie Soto is back? I think are the two that other people really have enjoyed. The reason I'm not interested in them is because what I've read online from other reviewers about these characters also being either from marginalized communities, being biracial, I don't think Taylor Jenkins Reid has the capacity to handle these characters respectfully. So I'm just not interested. Um, I read The Birth of Venus by Sarah Dunant. Dunant? Dunant? I don't know. Um, I don't think I talked about this in any of my uh, wrap-ups because I think that's when I was just about to go into surgery and quit my job. I enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, this is the story of a woman who she loves to paint. Um, she is in Italy. Michelangelo is Italy, right? Da Vinci, Michelangelo. She is back in like Michelangelo's era, just before Michelangelo really came on the scene. And she is part of a wealthy family. She does not want to be married off. She does not want to be a subservient wife. She just wants to paint and be free and read and study and learn and, you know, be equal with the other men in society. Um, that's not really a thing. So her mother, who understands her very well, um, does what she can to delay marriage as long as possible. It's not delayable forever though. And as her father's business, who is a merchant, a cloth merchant, as his business starts to deteriorate and fall by the wayside during, you know, political upheaval and things, it's more and more important that she get married off. So an arrangement is made and she marries somebody who is probably her best option, but she's, she's not aware of all of the details of this behind the scenes. Um, so she's, she's a little uh, traumatized when she does end up marrying and finding out he's not who she thought he was. But he does afford her a lot of freedom in her own life and she continues to paint and she meets this painter who she just admires. He has such skill and she wants to learn from him. And in turn, she also kind of becomes a muse for him. And it's, it just, it's about their 
relationship, but mostly about her and her life. And he kind of comes in and out of it, but has such a deep impact on her life and on her, the way that she views the world, the way that she views art and her place in the world through art and through learning. And I just really enjoyed it. So I would say, I think I gave it a four star. I would recommend it. It's definitely historical fiction. I'm not even really gonna call it a romance. Uh, it really wasn't, but there are moments of romantic interest with characters, with our main character throughout the book. Allegedly by Tiffany D. Jackson. And this was read, the audiobook was phenomenal. I can't recommend it enough. Bonnie Turpin, I think. I hope I got that right. Phenomenal audiobook narrator. Um, this is the story of a, of a teenage girl who is in a group home. She got out of prison. Um, she took the fall for her mother killing a white woman's baby. They are um, a black family. Her father was not in the picture, so it's just her and her mom. And her mother killed a white woman's, uh, the neighbor's baby who they were babysitting. And her mother had her take the fall. And you know, this has really messed her up. There's really no support system for her. She's crucified at trial. She's put into solitary confinement as a like 13 year old, 12 or 13 year old. She gets into this group home as she's a little bit older um, before her, her final release. And she's unpacking and dealing with what happened to her, the fact that her mother didn't love her enough to own up to what she did. And she ends up basically like struggling with, do I tell the police what really happened? And so she does end up becoming involved with um, a lawyer who works pro bono on her case to restore her good name, remove her criminal record and really put the blame where it belongs on her mother. But then it's called allegedly because you realize this is not a very reliable narrator and everything you've been led to believe may not actually be true. There's this line of, do you believe the mother's story or do you believe the narrator's story? Or do you believe either of their stories? Again, super well written, very dark though. I kind of knew going into it, I was probably not in the right mental state to consume that media. And I did it anyway, and it kind of wrecked me for a while. Um, so be warned. And then finally, you know what, let's end with, um, I think this was, yeah, the last book or the last review of the year, which was Hula by uh, Jasmine Yolani Hake. I loved this book. This was a four star read for me. Um, this book follows the story of mostly one woman, but really the, follows the story of three. It's the mother, her daughter, and then her granddaughter. And it really follows the middle character mostly, or uh, tells her story, but it then branches more into um, this woman's mother's story and this woman's daughter's story. And this is three generations of women who were born and raised in Hawaii, on the big island, especially her and her mother have completely opposite views of how to deal with the government, the US government and the reparations that should be due the Hawaiian people because they are part of a family line that is descended from the last of the Hawaiian royalty whose kingdom was literally stolen out from under them and not even by the government, but by the merchant system. And the government just kind of went, well, that kind of sucks. Um, and so it talks about the grandmother feeling that their right to their land, to their position, to their um, inheritance of the land, and the, from the perspective that they don't own land. they The land doesn't belong to them, but they belong to the land, and the land is being stolen. And so what they belong to, their identity, is also being stolen. And that is a very common theme of how people feel about it, but they approach it in different ways. So the grandmother wants to work within the system. She's like, you're not gonna beat the US government, we have to work with them to get what we need, which is our land, at least in some part, to be restored to us as Hawaiian people. Now her daughter, her adult daughter, feels very differently. She feels that the land has been stolen, and that they are being erased and pushed aside, but there's no working with the US government. You have to fight them. B 
because they will never concede because they don't have to concede. And so they have these two completely opposing viewpoints. There's a lot of tension. They don't speak for many years. And then you have this woman's daughter who is fair skinned, burns easily, red hair. She does not look at all Hawaiian, but she was born and raised in Hawaii. So it also talks about what does it mean to be truly Hawaiian and the family, the, the culture, the community that accepts her or rejects her and how she fits into her place in this world. And it's a big part of the book because the US government says you have to be, I think, 50% blood or more to be considered Hawaiian. And you have to be considered Hawaiian to be able to inherit the land through their program that they never actually distributed land from. And so the grandmother views her granddaughter who was born out of wedlock on a different island on Maui, doesn't know who the father is, you know, clearly he's, he's a haole, um, but her concern is that they will lose their familial land because it can't be passed on to somebody who doesn't have at least 50% blood and her daughter will not answer questions about the girl's father and the relationship and how it happened and what happened. And so there's, there's always this tension stewing among these three women. They're all so powerful in their own way. They're all doing what they think to be right in the way that they think to be right. And it talks about themes of community, of family, of, of does blood make you something or does does experience make you something? How do you know when you belong to a community and to a people and to a place? And how do you know when you don't belong? And the way that this, this little girl grows up and wants to be a part of her people is through hula. And the way that hula and the stories of Hawaii were passed through hula when other forms of storytelling were forbidden. And the erasure of the Hawaiian people and their culture and their history it's very moving, it's very affecting, it's very powerful as told through these stories. The, and I, again, I, I highly recommend the audiobook. It was narrated, um, I, I don't remember the narrator's name, um, but she is Hawaiian. And so you get the perfect pronunciation of these places and the accents of the people. And you're just transported through her narration and through the words on these pages um, by the author. And it's, it's beautiful and haunting and powerful. And I think it's a very important book because it's so important for people to realize when they go to these tourist destinations, are, is it even possible to be a tourist in a responsible way? And what are you contributing to the erasure of a native people of this place? Are you even welcome there by the people who it should be their decision whether or not people, foreigners, outsiders are welcome there? Um, so if you, it's, it's not a history book. The, the, um, the afterword to the book talks about how it's not meant to teach about hula. It's not meant to teach about the history of the Hawaiian people, but it is meant to tell their story in as accurate a way as possible to reach people. I think it was phenomenally done. I think it was very successfully done and I would highly recommend it. So if you're interested, check out that book. That's, that's it, that's my year in review. I had a pretty good year as far as quality. I just didn't have a lot of quantity and I hope this year coming up, I can change that. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this and I will see you soon.